This is the Daily Growth Discipleship Podcast. I'm Josh Havens. And I'm Chris Lambert. And we're on a journey to learn what it means to live a lifestyle of discipleship. We're glad you're joining us today, and we hope that as you set aside this time for God, that He will help you grow today in the everyday moments of life. One of the great compliments to practicing daily habits is to practice weekly habits as well. These are habits that add the best value when practiced a little bit spaced further apart. In this chapter, as we talk with Justin Early, we're going to be reviewing what he calls the weekly habits. And I think these are very important to balance out the daily habits. They're habits that are sometimes best practiced, not as frequently, but still add a really good rhythm and routine to the week overall. Justin Early has a Juris Doctorate from Georgetown University and is the creator of The Common Rule, a program of habits designed to form us in the love of God and neighbor. He's also a mergers and acquisitions lawyer in Richmond, Virginia. He previously spent several years in China as the founder and general editor of the Urbanity Project and as the director of Thought and Culture Shapers, a nonprofit organization dedicated to serving the community through arts. He and his wife, Lauren, have four sons and live in Richmond, Virginia. One of the habits that we're going to dive into specifically has really been impactful for Josh and mine's relationship, and that is conversations with a friend. It's why we've started a previous podcast called Theology in Progress, which naturally led into what we're doing now with Daily Growth Discipleship. And it's because of our relationship and able to wrestle with deep theological issues and share life together that has added so much to our journeys as disciples, both individually and together. We're able to constantly challenge each other and spur each other on in our pursuit of Christ. So I think this habit really has a lot to offer every one of us, especially because we're living in an age today when Although we feel more connected to people because of social media and how short distance seems, we've actually dehumanized ourselves by not being able to connect with people more often. So I think this habit is very important for us to learn to practice today. I want to jump over into um, the weekly habits then real quick. Again, there's so much more in the daily habits that I wish we could we had time to cover. And people will have to go out and buy the book for that. <laughs> um, They're welcome to do so. Yes. Uh, <laughs> hi- highly, highly recommend it. Um, but there, and there's, there's one particular uh, habit here in the weekly habits I want to make sure we have time to talk about. So real quick, the four habits here are one hour of conversation with a friend, fast from something for 24 hours, curate media to four hours, and Sabbath. Okay, real quick, I want to cover, because fast from something for 24 hours, pretty simple. Sabbath, pretty simple. I mean, you go into a lot more detail, so there's, I mean, they're not simple, but I think the simply gist of, said, simply more complicated said, to do, exactly. but yeah, I got some tips in the book for sure. <laughs> exactly. Um, what is one hour uh, of conversation with a friend? This is one of my absolute favorites. It's, it's the, the virtue or the rooted acknowledgement here is that friends will make or break our life because friends uh, were made for them or made to live in community. I think friends are the building blocks of community. And I think shared vulnerability, disclosing yourself in conversation, you know, telling what's on your heart, what you're afraid of, telling your secrets. Those are the building blocks of friendships. And so if you look at the state of most places that we live in now, we are trending hard and dangerously towards loneliness as the new cultural norm. More people live to get live alone, more people die alone, more people are not with their families, more people choose career paths that, you know, they move their life, they move their geography for career, not for friends. And we end up unsurprisingly very lonely people. And um, not only is that a health problem, there's actually fascinating studies that say that chronic loneliness reduces our life expectancy to the tune of 14 cigarettes a day, which is just mind boggling. I couldn't believe that was true. I actually, I actually like looked up the backup research and say, is this, is this peer reviewed? It is amazing um, and sad. But it's also, I think, it's a, an essential reminder that we can't, it's hard to understand the gospel fully until it's embodied to us in another person. 
And I think that what friendships, real vulnerable friendships do that are created through a habit of disclosing yourself to each other every week is they, what, you, what you're doing as a friend is, is saying, you know, you're really messed up, um, but I'm going to stick around anyway. Because anybody who's a friend over a long period of time, you hear confessions, you hear secrets, and you realize your friend is broken, but you're going to stay with them anyway. And the gospel essentially is that Jesus knows us fully, and yet he's sticking around anyway. So I think this kind of vulnerable friendship that happens, um, that, that, that won't just happen, it has to happen through intentionality. And that's why I suggest an hour of conversation a week. I think it's a reflection of the gospel and it's the way that we begin to build a community of love, which, which we then can invite our neighbors into through evangelism. It's, but it's the beginning of creating community. So that's why I want and hope that people will make a habit out of it, to make it normal, to disclose themselves to each other, to talk to each other. And you're talk, does the, does the conversation have to be about anything particular? Is it supposed to be spiritual or can it just be about the the sp- the latest sports or weather that's going on. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, low bar. I mean, I think if we actually adjust our schedules every week to have an hour of meaningful conversation with a friend, if, if people would start doing that, I'm going to be over the moon happy. Um, cause I think it's the beginning of so much beauty. Um, I talk a lot about vulnerability in the chapter and I think ideally what Really, what I'm trying to get at is the kind of life that is doesn't have secrets, the kind of life where you at least have somebody that knows you through and through. And I, and I tell people this when I talk about the book. You know, I I think you all, Josh and Chris, are, are great, um, but you don't know all of my secrets. And I think you know many. You know that nobody knows all my details and all my darkness, but there is someone here in Richmond who does. His name is Steve. And there's another one named Matt. And then there's my wife, Lauren. I don't have secrets, right? Somebody knows some, everything that happens, somebody knows about it. And that changes everything <laughs> because, because it, you know, I, I actually, uh, I, you know, I can't hide. And I long for people to enter into a kind of gospel community where they, they can't hide, but that's a safety net. That's not a threat. That's a safety net that you have somebody who knows you and forgives you and speaks the words of Christ's forgiveness over you. Yeah, and it, it holds you accountable too to it, right? I mean, it, it's not yeah, only just yeah. fulfilling the loving the neighbor and and learning to embrace that, but it's it holds you accountable. So it all feeds into each other. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I get weird when I'm alone, and I there's specific temptations that come when I feel or sense that I'm alone. So that's why I try to make sure that. I'm not. Yeah. You know, I try to make sure that I'm I'm visible to people. I tend to um I tend to behave the way I actually want to behave when my life is disclosed to other people. So it's a beautiful thing. Accountability is really important. Yeah, I tend to I I'm a I'm an introvert by nature and I tend to introspect a lot. And I I say it this way all the time. If I'm by myself and I spend a lot of time in my head, I go into deep dark places where it feels like I'm entering the twilight zone and rationality kind of <laughs> goes out the window. And so I need those conversations with other people to kind of ground me in reality. Right, right, right. And I'm sure you would agree. I don't mean to communicate There's um, that we're talking about, you know, don't be, don't be alone or don't have solitude. Those are actually incredibly important. It's just the idea that you don't have secret areas of life that you harbor. Yeah. You come out of your solitude. You come out of your inner life to share that life with others. Exactly, because that you know, studies also show that that is one of the the first ways, or one of the first steps down a path of destruction is when uh, CEOs or really anybody, but it, it, this research was pointed at CEOs, um, begin to make mistakes that end up in like huge moral failings where they have to leave the company in shame and stuff. And it's one of them is withdrawing from friends <laughs> for whatever reason. Uh, yes, and so. I think it, well, it makes complete sense to me. It makes complete sense to me that if you, if you imagine that you can live a life with some secrets, that imagination only grows larger and you become the kind of person who we then feel sorry for in the news. But how did they think that was going to work? But that's because we can convince ourselves of terrible lies and terrible evil when we're alone. And I think that's why they, that's why it's so important. I honestly consider this practice something to run to. I mean, running two community is really important. It's also a very protective practice. I mean, it helps me. Um, it helps me think about how do I walk with the Lord over the long run? You know, there's an armor in friendship 
Whereas the quarter three strand is not easily broken. And I think that's one of the really important things here. So the other one that I love the most in the weekly habits, just because it's so important for my own life. And, uh, I find this, this area of story, which is what it's all about to be so profound in our lives. And that is curate media to four hours. And in fact, when I first read it, of course, I don't know what that means. So I was instantly intrigued. Um, what do you mean by curate media to four hours? What I mean is, um, curation curation uh implies intentional choice because uh, limits exist so if you just think about a gallery wall what a museum does is say we got one wall what's the what's the best art or what's the art that we like how how are we gonna what are we gonna put on it so to curate is to decide and the the latin root famously of decide is to cut off you know when you pick one thing you cut off options of another thing and the reason I think curating is so important in our life generally, but especially towards media, is because I think we live in a specific time and a culture where we actually imagine in many senses of life that we can do it all, that we can have it all. And particularly in media, we, we just sort of let the stream flow. Um, we, you know, we stream anything, stream it always, stream whatever's in front of us. And if you look at your life, you just pay attention. You know, the restaurant you sit at tonight will probably have a couple screens in front of you. You'll always, of course, have your personal screen in your pocket. You'll come home and you'll see screens. You look in your living room and you see screens. And the danger is that um, people who do not love us and actually want to make money off us know how to do so through anger, through addiction. Um, you know, the, peop the thousands of MIT programmers paid amazing salaries on the other side of the screen mean that our screens are not neutral. People are trying to get our attention and sell it to advertisers or get our attention to, you know, buy the next thing. So we need to be really, really careful. But we also need to realize that stories are wonderful. So, I mean, I, I, I'm scared of the constant stream of media in one sense. But I also think we live kind of in a renaissance of television where there's actually great story writing and programming and wonderful movies coming out. So the idea is to, you know, resist, like we were talking about earlier, there's some things we need to resist, and that is the constant, uncurated attention to media. But there's some things we need to embrace, and that is watch beautiful stories. Watch stories that, that remind you that, that justice can and should be done, that there is evil, but heroes will win, and the ultimate hero will win. Um, watch things together, like sit in community, you know, spend your hours watching media with other people, not just, you know, curled up in the corner of your room with your phone watching something. Um, so th that's why I say curate to four hours because you set a limit and then you have to pick carefully. I'll be honest, I could care less if it's four hours or 15 hours. What I care about is, and I tell people all this time, and I say it in the book, pick, pick an hour limit that works for you and then curate. Curate for beauty, curate for justice, curate for immunity. Um, if we don't curate media, media is gonna curate our life for us. And this is a big new struggle right now. I mean, Sabbathing is, um, you know, m millennia old <laughs> commandment. Curating media is a, is a new issue because of technology. And so we need to be especially attentive to it. And doing it in community is a great idea because then that kind of lends itself toward having the conversation with a friend because you've, you're experiencing something together. Yes and, yes. and that kind of becomes the seed better, the foundation for conversation about life, what God's doing in your life, what God's doing in your friend's life. And that's cool. Yeah. And, and, you know, as we all know, you know, the music you listen to, the movies you watch, the shows that you follow, they create culture. You know, that we say, hey, did you see this recent episode? Or are you following this? You know, and some of that is wonderful. I mean, some of that's evangelistic. You, you watch, watch shows with your neighbors, see what they're listening to, you know, start conversations or, or watch movies with your community. It's a way to be together, have shared stories. But, um, but that's different, you know, that's different than just watching anything and everything all the time. Yeah, and, and it's so true how much the stories from the media shape our lives. You know, I often joke with my coworkers here, I think 90% of the things I say are actually quotes from either Friends or The Office. And <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. you know, <laughs> I don't know where you stand on those two shows or anybody listening, so please don't judge me too harshly. But um, <laughs> it does. It just ends up shaping the way that I talk, the way that I think, or like when somebody yeah. makes a reference, like that's what's in my mind. Right, right. And so, yeah, yeah go ahead. 
you, yeah, you have this canon of shared language, and which is, which is actually really cool. It is because um, Josh and I can but, have a whole conversation in shorthand that nobody would nobody understand. will know. <laughs> yeah, right, right, just from references. And, and I think what you know the um, the upside is that that you you watch things that are great, you know, like shows that um, you know any any show is going to have some stuff that you're like, oh, I need to be careful about that. But that that's that's what it means to live in the world. I mean, you, we're always going to encounter things that are inappropriate or skeptical. The question is, what do we do with them? And watching shows in community is it's a great way to, you know, do that. But I think what's interesting is the flip side of what you just said is what we don't realize is that let's let's go to media, um, news media. Let's say whether it's Twitter, NPR, Fox News, cable networks, whatever. Those also create a shared language and they also create shared emotions. What, but what is happening is dark. Um, you know, the owners of these media companies and the programmers of them know that anger is addictive that we can get so stirred up, you know, tuning into the morning news that we'll actually come back to check on it all day and then sit down to get more in the evening. And we will actually enter this liturgy together, liturgy of anger, that the other person is stupid, that, um, you know, problems would be easily solved if everybody just thought like us. And we are well aware, and we're all kind of worried about it, that we're being funneled into these sort of tribal echo chambers. And I think it's just important to acknowledge that it's not completely solved just to take away media, but it's not neutral. I mean, what's happening is that, you know, the, the anchors of these shows, the programmers of these these social media platforms are getting wildly rich while the rest of us get wildly angry. This is a social problem. And, and we need to think about how we can both engage with that and how we can change that, because social media could be wonderful in connecting us, but not the way it's currently designed. And news is so important. We need to know what our neighbors are going through. But the way it's currently designed is just to get us to feel a certain way so we come back for better ratings. Those are, if we go back to what we talked about earlier, uh, people in te technology design and people in the media professions need to think about the story of their professions and how they can use those things to create shalom, not to create cultures of anger. It's a really, really important missional question. Awesome. Well, Justin, thank you so much for being on with us. This has been extremely helpful. I can't recommend your book highly enough. I think everybody should go out and, and get it. It's not long. It's super simple. And you have some great illustrations, some great stories to get right to the heart. Very practical. Um, the common rule.org is where you guys need to go to check out more of Justin's work. And Links in the show notes. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Justin, thank you so much for being with us today. I tremendously enjoyed this conversation, so thank you all. As you go about your day, the rest of today, and into the weekend, I want to challenge you to do something that probably not a lot of spiritual growth challenges would involve. I want to challenge you to go see a movie. Now, I don't want this to just be any movie. I want you to pick a movie that tells a good story, like Justin talked about. And I want you to go do this with a friend. Because as we talked about in this chapter, Opportunities to have conversations with a friend are very valuable, and they really come about best when they come from these shared experiences that we have. So as you go about your weekend, go and see a movie with a close friend, because that movie will create an opportunity for a conversation where you can talk about what that movie says about life, our place in it, and whether that's correct with the biblical worldview or not. And then from that conversation, I'm sure much fruit and much growth can come out of it as you guys grow closer together and you discover what it's like to be on this journey of discipleship with each other. Thanks for listening to the Daily Growth Discipleship Podcast. If you want to stay up to date with everything that's happening at Daily Growth, go to dailygrowthdiscipleship.com and subscribe for free. Or subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Spotify.